Remember always that in the Musalman too, Narayana dwells and to him too our mother India has given a permanent place in her bosom. This is a quote of Sri Aurobindo that I chanced upon today. Now we may ask, what did Sri Aurobindo mean when he said that Narayana dwells in the heart of even the Muslim? So Sri Aurobindo in this quote is reflecting the highest truth outlined in the Vedas, the holiest scriptures of us Hindus. What is this truth? The Vedas say, I am Atma Brahm. The soul of every person is divine, Tattva Masi. At the level of your soul, you are one with God, you are one with Narayana. And therefore, Narayana dwells in the souls of all. And this truth is applicable to Muslims and Christians alike, even though they may not know of it, even though they may not accept it, yet this truth that the soul of each and every person on planet earth is divine holds true. So Narayana is present in each of our souls, including those of Muslims and Christians. Now when I read this teaching of Sri Aurobindo, my mind automatically went to the Gyanvapi Mosque controversy where seemingly the remains of a temple have been found under a mosque by the Archaeological Survey of India. This mosque, which is called the Gyanvapi Mosque, is located in the city of Varanasi, adjacent to the famous Kashi Vishwanath Temple, and the mosque was apparently constructed by the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb in the 1600s. So once the news went out that a temple previously stood on the site of the mosque, people on the internet automatically started saying that the mosque should now be demolished and a temple constructed back in its place. People felt that the historical wrong that had been committed by Aurangzeb in destroying the temple should now be rectified. So when I read all these views that people were sharing on the internet, it got me thinking. I started to ask myself, is it morally justifiable that we Hindus demolish the Gyanvapi Mosque and build a temple in its place? Is it right if we violently tear it down the same way we did to the Babri Masjid? Is it right that we demolish one house of God and build another in its place? The answer that came back to me was no. There is no way we can spiritually or morally justify demolishing one house of God and building another in its place. This is a deeply, deeply wrong thing to do for three important reasons. You see, we all love Sanatan Dharma. We all love Hinduism deeply and we all want it to flourish. But demolishing mosques and building temples in their place is not the way to make Hinduism flourish. By doing this, we will cause Hinduism to be wiped out from the face of the earth. We would have achieved the exact opposite of what we set out to achieve. Now please listen to this podcast right till the very end as I explain why demolishing the Gyanvapi mosque or any other mosque for that matter, this action or these actions will invite a very terrible danger upon Hinduism. Already, Buddhism is being wiped out in Tibet by this Asuric force and we in our deep-seated ignorance will be putting Hinduism too directly in its path. So let me outline for you the three reasons why it is not morally justifiable to demolish the Gyanvapi Mosque where Muslims offer their daily worship. The first reason is that Hindu scriptures simply do not give us this kind of permission. What do the Vedas say? Ekameva Dvitiyam. There is only one God, not two. Sri Ramakrishna Paramhansa, the Guru of Swami Vivekananda, has explained this teaching of the Vedas. He has said, Muslims, Christians and Hindus are all longing for the same God, but they do not know that he who is Krishna is also Shiva, is also the Divine Mother, Christ and Allah. And Sri Ramakrishna spoke this not from an intellectual perspective, but from the point of view of his spiritual realizations. He practiced both Christian and Islamic sadhanas and 
both these sadhanas when he practiced them took him to the same god as did the hindu sadhanas so based on his spiritual experience he wanted to test out the validity of all the other religions in this world and when he practiced them they took him to the same god as did the hindu sadhanas and that is why shri ramakrishna said that he who is krishna is also shiva and is also christ and allah so if shiva and allah are one and the same then how can we tear down one house of god and build another in its place committing violence against allah is equal to committing violence against shiva so neither temples nor mosques nor churches should ever be destroyed by anyone if aurangzeb indeed destroyed a temple and then built the gyanwapi mosque upon it then he did a huge wrong for which he should be answerable to god he will have to give an answer to god he will have to suffer the karmic consequences for it but we repeating his act we are not going to rectify any injustice done by him this is a false belief this is my second point that first of all in the year 1600 when aurangzeb was supposedly demolishing uh, the temple that stood in place of the gyanwapi mosque what were we doing back then that was the time when we should have stood up and put our life on the line and protected the temple but did we do this obviously not we hindus let him build a mosque in its place even the next generation of hindus did nothing to rectify the wrong neither did the generation after them for several generations we hindus did nothing so is this not cowardice why did we tolerate this kind of injustice are we so weak this is something for all of us to think about that if indeed aurangzeb destroyed a temple then why didn't we stop him now fast forward to the present times which is nearly 450 years later when aurangzeb is long dead now we want to rectify the injustice he committed and build a temple in place of the mosque but how is this bravery it is not at all any kind of bravery or even anything morally correct because now 450 years later our muslim brothers are praying at this mosque they had no role to play in demolishing the temple in 1600 aurangzeb did that and aurangzeb who supposedly demolished the temple went blissfully unpunished and now we are making all our muslim brothers and sisters who had nothing to do with aurangzeb's heinous crime we're making them pay by demolishing their place of worship so where is the justice in this how have we rectified this historical wrong we have not instead what we have done is that we have committed one more wrong in its place as swami vivekananda has explained in hinduism the ishta or the chosen ideal is of paramount importance we hindus never bring down any person's ishta that is why in india we have always been the land of tolerance and acceptance we know that people who are muslims today were probably muslims in their previous lives too and so they have been worshiping allah as their ishta for several lifetimes allah is their guiding light by which they are growing spiritually so why should we demolish their ishta to harm anyone's spiritual progress is the worst karma to incur because we are delaying this person's progress towards god realization we are coming between them and god and what can be a worse karma it is a terrible terrible karma it's a terrible sin and anyone who destroys anybody else's ishta has to suffer horrible consequences for this karma so because we in india know this we hindus know this knowledge that is why india has been the refuge of all those who have been persecuted by other religions that is why the jews have found a lovely home in india that is why the parsis are present in india it is because we uphold the sanctity of the ishta we uphold the god given right of everyone to choose their ishta we never interfere with anyone's ishta 
This is also the reason why Hinduism does not support religious conversions. We have never gone and converted other people to our religion. We have never maligned other religions. We have never spoken badly about them. None of our saints have done so. You just go through the history of our saints and you'll see how wonderfully broad-minded, full of love for everyone these people are. And because we respect the profound holiness of the Isht, of the chosen ideal for worship, therefore, we never delay anyone's journey to God-realization. Now you may say, but Muslims and Christians have destroyed other people's Isht. This is true. They have destroyed other people's Isht in their ignorance. This is why before the mothership of Sanatan Dharma, these religions should be looked upon as child religions. They do not yet have the whole encyclopedia of spiritual knowledge that we Hindus have. And therefore, because their knowledge is limited, they tend to commit huge mistakes. But we are not to make Muslims and Christians our gurus and start emulating them. We are not to copy their behavior. We are to stay true to our rishis and the knowledge contained in the Sanatan Dharm Hindu scriptures. We are the guru of the world. We have to show the way forward by our leadership, by our actions. We are not to forget our spiritual heritage and reduce ourselves to some kind of petty tit-for-tat, revenge-seeking mentality. We are not to become followers of the fanatical elements in Christianity and Islam and go about doing the same injustices that they have done. These fanatics have spoiled the name of Christianity and Islam by their bloodthirsty actions. So we are not to emulate this kind of an ignorant, depraved behavior. We are children of great rishis. As Swami Vivekananda has said, we are children of immortal bliss. We are children of Satchitananda. We are the custodians of the highest truths that permeate this universe and we must always remember that we have a very high and lofty flag to uphold. We are to behave and act like the Vishwaguru that Sanatan Dharm is going to become. So spiritually and morally from both these perspectives, destroying the Gyanwapi Mosque is completely wrong and unjustified. In fact, if we think about it, let's say somebody came and said, Oh, a Buddhist monastery lies uh, underneath the Jagannath temple. So now we must destroy that temple and rebuild the monastery. If somebody does that, how will we feel? We will feel so hurt. We'll feel so violated to see our temple destroyed. Imagine the pain in our heart. And now transfer this pain to our Muslim brothers and sisters. This is what they are feeling. This is the deep anguish they feel when they see their mosque getting destroyed for no fault of theirs. They didn't destroy the temple in the year 1600, Aurangzeb did. So why should we punish them? So we must not do to others what we don't wish to be done to us. If somebody destroyed a temple tomorrow in Pakistan, how will we feel? You know, we'll feel so bad and so hurt and we'll keep that thing in our heart forever. So we must keep our compassion and empathy alive. Hate, you know, is a very potent force. Once we have destroyed a few mosques, we'll go on destroying all the mosques in India. But when the last mosque, the, when the last church has been demolished, will our hate or will our, you know, hearts, the injustice that we have nurtured, the feeling of injustice that we have nurtured in our hearts, will this hate be quenched? No. How can it be quenched? Because... All this while, we have fed this hate with so much fuel. Okay, every time we demolish a mosque, we then fill ourselves with more hate and then go and demolish another mosque, you know. So the hate is growing. It's not diminishing. It's growing. So what will happen? In fact, if we carry on down this path, a time will come when the hate that we have carried for the Muslims and Christians will turn back like an arrow and attack our own selves. We will turn into cannibals. We will cannibalize our own religion. The old divisions between the various sampradayas of Hinduism, between the Vaishnavas and the Shaivites, 
between the Vaishnavs and the Advait Vedantists. All these divisions that are there under the tarp will resurrect and we will start to cannibalize on each other. We will start to destroy each other's temples. You know, so this scenario is not so far-fetched. It can easily play out. So hate is never the answer. Love, forgiveness and acceptance, as Swami Vivekananda has said, are the answer. The answer is not even tolerance. It is acceptance of the truth that all these religions, Hinduism, Sikhism, Christianity, Islam, all these religions take you to the same God. And lastly, I come to the third reason why we should never go down the path of destroying mosques and building temples upon them. This is because such an action will invite a very great Asuric force, a force that is working against the Divine's will. And this force, this Asuric force, will destroy Hinduism and India and make the subcontinent fall into a dark age. So what is this force? This force is the ambitions of the Communist Party of China. When we demolish a mosque in India, because Muslims are in a minority here and Hindus are in a majority, we feel that we can get away with such an act. But we forget that India is surrounded by Muslim neighbors. We have a lot of Muslim countries around us and the people in all these countries are watching our actions deeply. So we should think that what will this destruction of a mosque do to their psyche? How hurt will they feel? How insulted will they feel? And then what will they do? They will obviously break all ties with us. And who is waiting to take advantage of this disunity, this lack of unity, this lack of friendship? Who is taking advantage of this? It is none other than China. If you've been watching the news, you would have heard about the situation in Maldives. Maldives is a Muslim nation and their government has just asked the Indian military to leave and it has invited the Chinese Navy in its place. So now the Chinese Navy with missiles aimed at Indian cities is going to be stationed right at our border in the south. Pakistan, our other neighbor, it too is a Muslim country and it has already allowed China to build roads and railways right down the country all the way to the Gwadar port which is very close to Gujarat, which is very close to Mumbai. You know, our oil refineries of Reliance are located in Gujarat and Mumbai is India's financial capital. Now imagine if China stations its nuclear submarines in the Gwadar port. You know, Bangladesh is another Muslim nation to our east and we have historically enjoyed a great relationship with them. But if we go on fostering divisions between Hindus and Muslims in India, it will have a repercussion on our ties with Bangladesh. So again, we would have distanced another wonderful neighbor of ours and made them go into the arms of China. So China is making a very sustained effort to surround India. And while it's doing this, we, instead of trying to counter China strategically, we are focused on satisfying our petty desires of revenge. It is an extreme pettiness that we are catering to right now. And it is unbecoming of our great spiritual heritage. It's really an insult to our spiritual heritage to, you know, for us to revel in this kind of a petty revenge. And India is China's number one target. Anyone in the Indian military will tell you that Pakistan is not our enemy. Our enemy is China. If they conquer India, they will control the whole of South Asia and from there they can easily move to conquer Australia and Africa. In fact, the Communist Party of China is an atheistic force. They do not believe in God. So when they conquer the Indian subcontinent, they'll wipe out all the religions. 
they will wipe out Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, Buddhism, whatever be the religion, Christianity, whatever be the religion, they will completely erase it. And if you doubt this, you should just look at the history of Tibet. Look at what the Chinese have done to Tibet. They have thrown out the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is a refugee in India. And what they have done is they have appointed their own stooge in his place. The Chinese will decide in future who our gurus will be and what they should teach us. These gurus will only sing praises of the Communist Party of China and their leader. And they will not tell you anything about Rahama or Krishna. Okay, so the whole of Hinduism will be wiped out. The Communist Party of China will be the new god that we all will look up to. And this is not something fantastical because you can already see it playing out in Tibet. There the Chinese have destroyed the Buddhist monasteries and most importantly, they have destroyed the Buddhist scriptures. They have eradicated the complete Tibetan culture. That is why they have got rid of the Dalai Lama. They don't want anybody who is sensible, who knows the cultural knowledge to be around. They want to now revise the culture. They'll give you a new culture. And we should understand in a very deep way that the scriptures are the bedrock of any religion, not the temples, not the mosques, not the churches. These are not the bedrock of any religion. Swami Vivekananda has specifically said that temples have no hold on the Hindu religion. If all the temples were destroyed, Hinduism would not be affected a grain. But if they destroy our scriptures, if they destroy the collective spiritual knowledge of our rishis, then it is game over. And the Chinese are perfectly capable of this. They will simply, in the name of social harmony, shut down all the mats, all the akharas, all the temples, they'll make it a crime to read the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Vedas, the Upanishads. Now, none of us will be able to do a thing. Just as they do not allow free speech in China, any content they don't like is immediately taken down. They don't even allow Google into China. So, you know, they have clamped down on information so much. So how easy will it be for them to get rid of everything. It will be very, very easy. Okay? Just as they don't allow any free speech in China. And if you revolt, you know, they'll just carry out a brutal repression. They are known to harvest the organs of the dissenters. So, they will carry out the same brutal repression and impose their culture by wiping out our Vedic heritage. Okay, now this possibility that I've just outlined for you is not something that I have imagined. It has been categorically predicted by both Sri Aurobindo and Mother Meera. Both of them were God-realized rishis. They possessed Trikal Drishti. All three divisions of time, the past, the present and the future were accurately known to them by their yogic sight. In fact, on the eve of India's independence, when India was partitioned into Pakistan and India, when Jinnah, by his communal campaign, managed to, you know, convince many of the Muslims that they would not be safe and secure to pursue their own religion in India, when he had sowed these seeds of dissension and division, at that time, Sri Aurobindo had issued a prescient warning. He said, India today is free, but she has not achieved unity. The old communal division into Hindus and Muslims seems now to have hardened into a permanent political division of the country. It is to be hoped that this settled fact will not be accepted as settled, because if it lasts, India will be seriously weakened, even crippled. Civil strife may remain always possible. Like we'll always have riots, we may have a civil war within India, another civil war. We already went through one at the time of the partition. But if we continue to stoke these divisions between Hindus and Muslims, then we may foster something else, which is again a civil strife. Okay. And worse than this, Sri Aurobindo has said that civil strife may always remain possible, possible even a new invasion and foreign conquest. And here he's pointing 
to an invasion by China. Now, if you want to learn more about Sri Aurobindo's predictions on a Chinese invasion, then watch our earlier video, which is titled Communalism and China, Two Threats Which Can Wipe Out Hinduism and Vedic Culture from India. Now, Mother Meera, who was the spiritual counterpart of Sri Aurobindo, she too issued similar warnings. In her vision, she has seen the possibility of the Chinese invading India. And this is what she has said about them. She has documented, because again, Mother had Trikal Drishti, she could see these possibilities playing out. And in this vision, she saw how brutal the Chinese would be. And she has said this. She has said, but already, quite some time ago, I saw China invading India, even South India. And that is the worst of catastrophes. The Chinese don't have a psychic being, meaning they don't have a conscience. And so one can expect anything from them, every possible horror. To be under Chinese domination, it is better to die first. This is what mother has said. And she has continued. They are, from the point of view of sensitivity, they are monsters. These are the mother's words. It will probably take centuries before things can return to normalcy. Now you can read the full detailed article about what mother has said on the possibility of a Chinese invasion by visiting the spiritualbee.com. And you can read the full article over there as well as other articles on this topic of Hindu-Muslim unity, why we should foster it in this time in India. Therefore, it is my deepest prayer to anyone watching this episode, whether you're Hindus or Muslims, whether you belong to India or to Pakistan or to Bangladesh, I want you to know and I want you to, I pray to you that we should all work together to uproot suspicion and doubt about each other from our minds. Let us not destroy each other's places of worship, neither in India, nor in Pakistan, nor in Afghanistan, nor in Bangladesh. We must support and care for each other. We must unite. The whole of South Asia must come together as one block, firm and united against China. We must not allow them to make inroads into our subcontinent. We must overcome our communal divisions and unite. And in this, the Hindus have to take the lead because we are the majority population. Okay, we have to take the lead. We are a great country. We are a powerful country. And so we have to take the lead to unite. We have to unite within India first and then we have to bring our neighbors together. We have to overcome our communal divisions and unite. Nothing less than this is demanded of us in this crucial time. To unite means to save Hinduism, to save Islam, to save all the religions of the Indian subcontinent for future generations. And to stay divided means to watch these erased by a brutal Chinese oppression. So history is watching us and it wants us to make the right decision right now before it is too late. Thanks for listening to this episode. This is Pulkit Mathur, the founder of The Spiritual Bee. And we'll meet again soon in another podcast.